What's up, guys? My name is Brian Davila. Welcome to the Wealthy Investor Podcast. And today I have someone very special on the podcast. His name is Jerry Norton. And we're going to go over the wholesale regulations that are going on right now and could destroy the entire wholesale industry and new regulations for house flippers that could also hurt how much investors are making. So Jerry Norton, how are you, baby? Good, good. Good to be with you again, Brian. How are you? Yeah, excited to have you on. Um, I've been watching your YouTube channel a lot recently, um, and you've been talking about it for, I think, years, how you years. think regulation is going to disrupt the real estate wholesaling industry. So I guess, can can we just get straight to it? Like, what yeah. what is happening right now for um, wholesalers? Well, I mean, first of all, in the last few years, wholesaling has morphed into this multi-billion dollar industry. So, you know, years ago, when I got started 20 years ago, it was sort of like this obscure kind of technique that nobody really knew about. It was sort of like a plan B strategy, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And now today, it's just this thriving multi-billion dollar industry. So it's getting a lot of attention. And with that attention, you know, the bad actors are getting some light. So then now you've got consumer protection and regulation and, and regulatory bodies that are taking notice to wholesaling. So that's kind of where this is all stemmed from. Got it. And then I guess what are some states that you're seeing um, regulations come uh, into? Yeah. So leading into that, what's happening right now is, and this has been an age old debate for a long time, but there's a certain, there's a certain thought process that wholesaling is brokering. And yeah. if you know what brokering is, brokering is when you assist somebody in the buying or selling process for a fee. So every state has a real estate commission to govern the process of brokering. And if you're falling into brokering in any way, then the real estate commission by state then has jurisdiction over you. They require a real estate license. They require that you follow specific rules and you're basically under the umbrella of their oversight. So that's all real estate agents. Every single real estate agent, they have to have an active license. They have to do continuing education. They have to follow a lot of rules to, to hold an active license because they're getting paid to help somebody buy or sell real estate. They could potentially harm somebody in that process. Mm -hmm. So they have to follow all the rules and, and it's, it's meant to protect the consumer. So the argument now is like, okay, well, wholesaling is brokering. Now we've always argued as wholesalers that no, it's not because I'm, a holder of a contract. I have an equitable interest in the contract. I'm selling my rights to my contract. I'm not helping somebody buy or sell real estate. That's the argument we make. And we, you know, it's a valid argument because technically that is what we do when we wholesale, like a, an assignment of contract is selling the, that equitable interest, the right to the contract. But that's not how the real estate commission is now seeing it. And they're actually passing laws that are specifically defining wholesaling in some way or another as brokering, which then is putting wholesalers under that same umbrella as agents, which they now have to follow the oversight of the real estate commission. So this mm -hmm. is where this whole thing is, is like, uh, it's, it's very controversial because we argue that no, we're not brokering, but now laws are being passed that are saying, yes, you are brokering and you better follow the rules or you're going to be subject to penalties and, and so on, fines and penalties. Now, with this brokering idea, there's two trains of thought. One is that selling your contract is brokering. So any type of marketing and selling of a contract is brokering and needs a real estate license. And that would be Nebraska, Oklahoma, Kentucky, North Dakota, and Iowa are some of those states that, that are saying, hey, if you market a contract for sale, so that would be saying like on a Facebook group, hey, I've got a contract for sale. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything that they would consider publicly marketing they're saying, okay, that act of publicly marketing your contract for sale is the same thing as brokering and you have to have a license. Well, that's sort of an easy workaround for wholesalers because we can say, okay, well, you know, I'm not publicly marketing it. I've got a cash buyer list that I email or whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, but then some states are saying, no, the very act of wholesaling, the assignment of contract as a business practice is brokering and requires a license. And that's Illinois, Virginia, Pennsylvania and South Carolina are saying any and all type of whole, doesn't matter how you market your contract, just doing it is brokering and needs a real estate license. Uh, the other mm. thing, Brian, that we're seeing a lot of right now is the, the newest trend with these regulations is disclosure. So some are saying 
you got to have a license. But then a lot of them, like all the recent ones and this year, most of them all have a disclosure requirement and you have to disclose to the seller that you're a wholesaler and your, your intent is to sell the contract. You have to disclose mm -hmm. things like they have a right to an appraisal. And a lot of the penalties are if you don't properly disclose, then the seller can cancel the contract and, and not close and, and not have any repercussions. Mm. Uh, so that's some of the, the, you know, the backlash if you do that, right? Yeah. What's really interesting is Pennsylvania, they just pushed through the House and the Senate. We're waiting for the governor to sign. But Pennsylvania said, okay, wholesaling in and of itself is brokering, need a license. You have to do disclosure. But even with disclosure, the seller has a full 30 days to cancel the contract for any reason whatsoever. They can just cancel the contract for no reason. Yeah. So you don't really have a contract then. You don't have a contract. Yeah, you don't have a contract. Yeah. It's not a contract. Yeah, if they could just do whatever they want, they can cancel, they can sell to someone else, they could do... The cash buyer um, could go directly to the seller. You know, another wholesaler could offer $1,000 more. I mean, like, yeah. it, it basically invalidates a legally binding contract. You know, like, the, the risk you take now in Pennsylvania now... That has to get signed by the governor, which when it passes the House and the Senate, it almost always gets signed by the governor. Um, and then it goes into effect six months after that. So we're probably looking at early 2025 where that will be law in Pennsylvania. A license, a bunch of disclosure, and the seller can back out for any reason for 30 days. And then, so I used, I, I am a realtor in California. I used to be a realtor in Las Vegas. So does that mean in Pennsylvania, all wholesalers would have to work under a broker? And then yes. depending if the broker has splits, they would also have yep. to pay the broker and then follow any other rules that the brokers have. So they yeah, have to and follow bring, the law. Well, and well, you, the got a, you got a bigger problem before that. So this, the states that require licensing pretty much kills virtual wholesaling because you, to, to live in California and to get a real estate license in Virginia, for example, yeah. Virginia isn't going to let you unless you're a resident of Virginia. Most of, these, most of the licensing requires that you're present in Virginia. There are some exceptions like Florida because they have a lot of um, you know, snowbirds and stuff. There's some exceptions. But not only do you have to – because the licensing is in the state where you transact, not where you live. So it doesn't matter yeah. if you live in Vegas or California, wherever you're mm -hmm. transacting are the laws you have to follow in that state. Yeah. So this is yeah, going to do I'm... a lot of, this is going to sort of disrupt majorly the virtual wholesaler industry. The guys that live in, you know, they just live anywhere mm -hmm. and, and virtually wholesale all over or in specific markets remote from where they live. You're going to, yeah. we're going to see that disrupted big time with this as well. But technically you're right. You would have to get a license in the state where you're transacting You'd have to be to, to have an active license. You have to be under a broker. That broker now is responsible for you. They're liable yes. for you. You do something mm -hmm. wrong. They're held responsible. So yes. some of these brokers are going to are going to you're a big liability as a wholesaler. They may not even want you if they do oh, take sure. you They They may mm -hmm. want splits. So I'm with real yes. brokerage yes. and with real real made me because I have an active license in Michigan. So real made me. Um, they made me sign this uh, agreement that, that they have no part whatsoever in wholesaling. If I wholesale, I'm on my own. They're not held liable. So as such, I don't have to pay them splits, but they're basically mm -hmm. washing their hands of me doing any wholesaling. And that's how, that's how real brokerage is handling wholesalers right now. Yeah. So with my, with my old brokerage here, um, so people have perspective, I wanted to start getting into investing. So buying houses, uh, I didn't even know about wholesaling. I just want to start flipping. My original broker told me no. He was just like, oh, yeah. you can't do it. Yeah. So not like that's why I was the, the point I was trying to make is you're going to have to follow the state law. And then if your broker says you yeah. can't wholesale, you can't flip. My old broker didn't even allow me to double end uh, realtor transactions. Yeah. So any other rules that that broker has, yeah. you have to follow or you're going to have to find an investor friendly broker um, which also I feel like those brokers are going to have more control now. Well, there, there, and there's going to be fees of some sort because maybe they want a, a, a percentage of your wholesale fees. Maybe they want a monthly fee just to be there. They're going to all require, you know, E and O insurance. So this, this automatically introduces fees and you have to stay current on your license. So that means you gotta be, 
you got to take the test, pass the test, get the state, you know, all the yeah. things, do the continuing education. So this does add a layer of cost to, to transacting as a wholesaler. Even if your broker allows you to do it, you're still going to have ongoing fees because every broker is going to want you to pay something if you're under his brokerage. Yeah. So do you think wholesaling as we know it is going to be over by, let's say, 2026? Well, the scariest one of all, which I did not mention yet, was South Carolina. So South Carolina just passed a law that uh, there's a lot of controversy around this. There's a lot of like people trying to find these little loopholes and stuff. Um, I've interviewed one of the commissioners, Gary Pickren, uh, on my channel where he's talked about it. He's, on the he's one of the real estate commissioners, and he's explained how the commission is looking at it. I saw he was recently on Bigger Pockets talking about it as well. But South wow. Carolina, what they did was really sort of a backhanded approach to it. First, what they did, Brian, get this. They said, okay, if you're going to wholesale, you have to have a real estate license. Now, that's what everybody's doing, so that, nothing weird there. But you have to understand why the real estate commissions are doing this. By, by mandating that wholesaling is brokering and you're underneath their umbrella means that they now have oversight over you and they can say what you can and can't do and how you do it. So mm -hmm. they said, okay, this is what wholesaling, we define wholesaling. If you're going to wholesale, you have to have a license. And then they added another clause in their regulation that said, absolutely under no, under no conditions are licensed agents allowed to wholesale. And when I first oh, read wow. this, I was like, this makes no sense at all. It's a, it's a giant contradiction. First, they're saying you have to have a license. Then they're saying once you have a license, you're not allowed to do it. And that's exactly the intent. The intent was to bring it underneath wow. the, the real estate commission and then to not allow it to happen. So, um, and this is, this is an attorney state. South Carolina is an attorney state. So who's liable if something goes wrong? The attorney is going to get pulled into a lawsuit for violating this law. So what you're seeing right now is you're seeing closing attorneys want no part of this at all, like doing traditional wholesaling assignments. There's even debate over whether a double closing is allowed. Uh, novations look like they're out. I mean, it looks like that South Carolina is trying to stop it altogether, not just require licensing, but stop it altogether. Yeah. And so if that takes fire, if that, if that trend sort of happens and we start to see that happen, you know, state by state, then potentially we could see wholesaling as we know it today be completely different. That's, that's crazy. And I do want to talk about like all the regulations and I know it's scary, but um, after that, I do want to talk about the strategies that people will be able to use in North Carolina, Illinois, wherever, um, to make money in real estate. Cause there's yeah. always going to be a, a way to make yeah. money. But as we know, like in, in real estate, things change so much that if you're not able to adapt, you will go out of business. Yeah. I mean, one um, thing's for, one thing's for certain, Brian, um, you know, this friction that this is causing is definitely, you know, we're seeing a, a purging of the industry, so to say, right? So, you know, the people that come in and they're like, oh, I got to get a license, I'm out. Okay, yeah. well, if that's all it took for you to get out, then you never meant to, you were never meant to be here in the first place. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so part of this is, is uh, I think, is sort of a good thing in a way. Like, I'm not a fan of regulation and government oversight and overreach, which certainly some of this is. I'm, I'm not a fan of that at all. But I think it's going to create a massive opportunity, just like the just like the NAR uh, settlement is going to create a massive opportunity for some agents. The rest are all going to quit and leave. But for the yeah. ones that learn how to do a sales presentation and learn how to adapt and, you know, they're going to kill it. So I think wholesaling is the same thing. The people that adapt right now are and pivot are going to do it really well. Like the smartest thing you could do would be to go into South Carolina right now and set up a wholesale operation. You're going to have to do it differently, but think about it. All the, all the virtual guys are gone and all the people that have a little bit of friction are gone. All the people that are, that don't want to comply and, and do things differently. They're all gone. So that means for the real players, massive opportunity. But is it because like, let's, let's say if this much regulation is happening right now, aren't they just going to go after any other way? So I've heard, I have friends in, um, South Carolina. I don't know if you know Ruby. Um, I've had her on the podcast before. She's like a young girl. Um, we posted a reel about her buying rental properties and she's more for appreciation, but great girl crushing it. And she's in South Carolina, but she flips houses. Yeah. So she buys 
and buys it. flips it. Yeah. yeah. So she doesn't have to worry about that. But from other wholesalers that I've heard in the area, they're just doing finder fee agreements. So instead of wholesaling it or assigning it to the end buyer, what they're doing is they'll connect the end buyer with the seller and then they'll charge or have an agreement with the buyer for the buyer to pay them a finder's fee agreement. Have you heard of any way, any workarounds? Well, yet? that, that bef- without any regulation violates brokering in and of itself. You cannot do that no matter what, because oh, that really? comp- yeah, that compensation you receive from the buyer, that is the definition of brokering. There's no selling my contract. There's I'm getting paid by the buyer to assist in the transaction. That's brokering. So that never was allowed. And if anybody's doing that, they're violating brokering law, regardless of any of this regulation. So finder's fee, have you heard of finder's fee agreements? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they're, a, bird and dog, a bird dog fee is technically illegal. That's brokering, a bird dog fee. Really? Yeah. That's the very, Why is it illegal? because that's the very definition of brokering. Brokering is when I'm involved in a transaction, helping a seller or a buyer, either one, I'm helping in the transaction and I get paid compensation. That's brokering. But how is it you're helping them if you get a contract signed with, uh, I guess, how would you make it, how how would you do it the right way then? Well, the right way would be you're, you're a principal in the contract and you sell your contract. If that's not allowed, the only way where you could do that would be you don't get compensated on the transaction, the first transaction. And then later when the flipper sells it, maybe they go back and they pay that bird dog a fee on, on the resell. Like if it's a flipper, maybe, I mean, that doesn't help if it's a buy and hold investor, but because now it's, it's, it's another transaction later. Uh, well, even then you're, you're paying somebody when you sell real estate. So you cannot do that. I mean, if, if you were to, if you were to present that to the real estate commission in any state, they would fine you and that you would be in trouble for that, for doing oh, that. Oh, damn. All right. Yeah. Well, don't do that then. Yeah. Some people call that I heard reverse, people are doing. Yeah. People call it reverse wholesaling. And that's where, what you do is you, the other way people do this is uh, they'll go find a deal, right? They'll find a seller. Uh, they sell, they're in negotiations, but they don't want to lock it up unless they know they've got a buyer. So then what they do is they go to their buyer buddy and their buyer and they say, okay, take a look at this deal. Tell me your number. And then the buyer says, well, I'll pay 150. And then you say, okay, great. Uh, and then you go and you say, let me, let me just hook you up with my seller and, and you step in and buy it. And when it closes, we have a deal between us that, that you'll pay me 10 grand. Like same mm-hmm. idea, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's sort of like reverse wholesaling because you find the buyer and then you find them a deal. Well, that $10,000 that you receive, what is that? You can call it whatever you want. You can call it consulting. You can call it whatever you want. The real estate commission is going to call it brokering and they're going to require you have a license to do that. Hmm. What about, I know this is go, going in a different place, but what about like these companies that are charging um, and selling leads, but I guess they're not really talking to the sellers. So then that wouldn't be considered a, 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 a brokering fee, right? Because they're not, they're, they're not actually speaking to the sellers directly and connecting them. Yeah, it's it's just all about uh, what's your role in the transaction and what is that fee you're getting? Is that brokering? Got so it. that I mean, that's the question every you got to ask yourself is and if you know you can you can do anything until you get caught, right? <laughs> so yeah, so like if you're if you're unsure, you know, reach out to your local real estate commission and say, hey, is this something that I'm allowed to do? I'll tell you something that happened to me in Idaho. So in Idaho. I had somebody that was working as a bird dog for me. This was an on-market deal. So we were working with an agent. We made an offer and the offer was rejected. So it wasn't even a successful transaction. The bird dog that was working with the agent said to the agent, hey, if this deal goes through, Jerry Norton is going to pay me a finder fee. Well, the deal didn't go through. The agent was disgruntled for whatever reason. They contacted the real estate commission and the real estate commission gave me a $4,000 fine for attempting to broker a deal. And they said the very act of offering compensation to somebody, even though the transaction didn't go through and I never actually paid the bird dog fee, the very act of offering and, and doing, you know, doing, attempting to do it violated the law. And I got, and I had to pay a $4,000 fine to the state of Idaho. But isn't there a lot of people doing like 
courses and stuff like that where you're teaching people how to bird dog? Well, if you do it in the traditional sense where you're not a principal in the contract and selling your rights to the contract, outside of that, that would be brokering and, and you would be in violation of the law. So, so I guess like teach us how's the correct way. Let's just say I have all the people watching this podcast and I want to say, Hey dude, I will partner with you. Right. Yeah. And if it gets too sketchy, we'll just completely cut this out of this. <laughs> but <laughs> well, if we're so like, are, Hey, I want to do yeah. deals. How well, do well, I, how do I do that? Hey guys, quick break from the podcast. First of all, thank you for listening to the Wealthy Investor Podcast. Also, I want you to know in the description of this video, there is a link. If you want to do deals with me in Las Vegas, California, or anywhere in the country, go to the link in the description, fill out the information. If you fill that out, you'll get access to the deals that we're wholesaling, but also fund a deal and partner with you, or I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching. So if you want me to help you get your first deal, or help you scale your business, just go to the link of the description. Now let's get back to the podcast. I mean, one loophole that I do quite a bit with, um, with bank properties, so this would be REOs and short sales, all REOs and short sales have a no assignment clause. Yeah. So you have to double close those. You, you cannot do an assignment and they won't let you add it in. They won't let you exclude that part of the contract. I've tried it and they won't, right? And I've done, I've done what I'm about to share. I've done hundreds, maybe thousands of times, because back in 20, when the 08 crash happened, everything was an REO and I was wholesaling like crazy. So what you do is you set up a new LLC and the LLC contracts the property. So this isn't your operating LLC that you do business out of. This is an independent LLC, single member LLC. You set that up, that LLC contracts the property. And then rather than assign the contract, you sell the membership rights of the LLC to your cash buyer. So then the cash buyer steps in as the new member of the LLC of contract. So, they, so the buyer of contract never changed. The owner of the LLC changed. And now what you're doing is you're, this isn't, and the thing about this is, is it's not on the HUD. It's not on the settlement statement because this is a business transaction, not a real estate transaction. I sold my LLC to the buyer, not the contract or the property. And then okay. they step in, they're the new buyer. They sign at closing, single closing. And the fee they pay you is a, is a, is a fee to buy an LLC. It's a, it's a business selling of a business fee, not a, not a, um, not an assignment fee or double close. Right. So I do that. I do that all the time. I have an active deal right now. That's a short sale and that's how we're, I'm waiting for approval, but that's how we're doing that deal. Now, um, is that a loophole with some of these regulations and stuff? Possibly. Um, but again, all of this comes down to how the, how the real estate commission is going to define what you're doing. So this is what, the, this is what South Carolina told me. And this, this shed a lot of light on a lot of these laws and regulations. And this shuts down everybody's argument too. I hear, I hear this argument all the time like, oh, just double close, no big deal. Just double close, no big deal. Maybe, but I mean, guys, like what, what is going on though? What's the underlying tone? What's the purpose of the regulation? What are they trying to stop? They're trying to stop wholesaling as the, and they define this by making money on something you don't yet own. So that's a double yeah. close. That's an assignment. That's an ovation. You don't own the property and you're trying to make money in a transaction. That's yeah. what they're trying to stop. That's what they don't like because the seller doesn't know what's going on. A buyer mm -hmm. doesn't know if you can convey title. Like that's the issue. Once yeah. you buy it and own it and take title and it's in your name, you can do whatever you want. And that's not the issue. The issue is, are you trying to make money on a property you don't own? Like if we Got really it. look at what they're trying to stop, that's what they're trying to stop. So maybe you can get away with a double close in Virginia without a license and stuff like that. Like maybe you can, but you know, if, if that's put in front of the REC, they might look at that and say, yeah, that's not what we're trying. That's not what we intended to do was stop the assignment, but not the double close. We don't want you doing this without a license yeah. and without oversight. Like that's, that's the big picture of what they're trying to do. And like, how many, how many real estate transactions do you think you've closed over your career? I mean, 20 years actively. I mean, right now I'm in wholesale. I'm actively in six markets and we transact, you know, multiple deals every single month, six figures, some of, some of those markets, six figures routinely monthly. So, you know, a lot. Uh, and that's just, that's just my wholesale operation, not counting flipping and, and other things. Right. So I mean, I'm very active at wholesaling today in the market, uh, and I do yeah. some virtual on my own outside of, of core markets that I, that I actively market in and transact in. 
So, like, I'm very concerned about this. I mean, people are like, Jerry, you're fear-mongering. No, I'm not. I'm just telling everybody, like, what's actually happening. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. what I, like, I get so much heat for talking about this. What hap What's happening here, Brian, is the education industry, which I'm very much a part of, the education industry wants to gloss this over and not talk about it because we thrive on beginners coming into the business. And yeah. if we tell a beginner, hey, there's some friction here, then maybe they're going to go do something else that's easier. So we yep. tend to like, oh, it's not a big deal. Oh, just double close. Oh, you know, Jerry's Jerry's hyping this up. It's not that big a deal. You can still do it. It says right here this or something. And what, what everyone's doing is they're ignoring the fact that the language in the marketplace, these regulators, what they're saying is they're saying wholesaling is predatory. It's harmful to sellers. We do not like it. We do not want it. We want to stop it. That's the narrative on the streets. Yeah. What do you think as far as because I, I, I do want to talk about scaling scaling a business a little bit later, but like how many deals do you think you close a year right now? Over over a hundred a year. Like a lot more, more than a hundred or like a lot more 100? than a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. So five to 10 per market in five markets. Yeah. So anywhere from 25, so most months, 25, probably a month. So you're closing probably close to 300 real estate. Probably a couple hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Probably 250, 300 a year. Yeah. So for people who may not know who you are, like you're not just some like guy that has a course. You're actually still day to day just running through mm -hmm. deals almost every day, every working day of the year, which mm -hmm. is crazy. But um, so the reason I asked that, if you were starting over today and you lived in a Pennsylvania, would you still try to become a wholesaler? Yeah, that's a, f a fantastic question. So first of all, anywhere you still can do the assignment, great. I mean, it's awesome because it's low risk. Doesn't make any. It doesn't need any money to do it. Like I'm still, I'm still doing assignments everywhere I can. I'm just not disillusioned to what's happening, and I'm not ready for it. I'm not getting ready for it or ready for it. And I'm not a one trick pony. The assignment of contract is one method to make money transacting real estate. And people yeah. need to understand that if you get into this business and you're a one trick pony, you're in trouble on the right out of the gate. You're in trouble because yeah. that's not the best strategy every time. And you need to learn how to transact multiple ways, just like mm -hmm. I'll fix and flip, just like I'll do luxury. I'll do, you know, I'll do novation. I'll do multiple strategies that are still under the umbrella of flipping. Cause to me, I'm a tra I'm a transaction year, right? Like I like to do deals where I get in, I get out I make as much as I can. Sometimes that's an assignment because it's fast, it's easy. I'll take a quick 15,000 or 20,000 and be done. Sometimes I stay in the deal and I see it through to the end and I do the repairs and I try to make the $100,000 and get all the meat on the bone, right? And so like what I'm teaching people is come into this business with both feet in the business. Come in with your full, all your heart and soul, right? This is not a fly by night, get rich quick thing. It used to be maybe, yeah, or yeah. we used to sell it that way or people sell it. Yeah, people yeah. still try to sell it that way. If you're thinking this is a get rich quick and you're not going to have to work your ass off, go do something else because this is work. This is effort. More and more, it's going to require capital, which means you got to learn how to raise money to do deals. Like where wholesaling's yeah, yeah. going, the, where, where wholesaling's going is you're going to need money. You're going to have to go get the money and buy the freaking house. Like you're going to have to do that. That's the future yeah. of wholesaling. You got to buy it. You got to take yeah, some yeah. risk, right? Like, yeah. It, it blows my mind that people are like, no, 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 let's not touch it. Let's pretend like, you know, no risk wholesaling is going to be here forever. It's not going to be here forever. It's going away yeah. quickly. Yeah. I think, I think I have a different perspective because I've always, I started off flipping and I, I never really was like a big wholesaler until recently. So I've been used to like yeah. having hundreds <laughs> of thousands of dollars just going out <laughs> and being broke all the time. So yeah. to me, I'm like, well, if, if, if it's going to transition to buying real estate, then I do that. So I'm not really worried about it. But for the guys that don't know how to buy real estate, and it's funny too, because so at Wealthy Investor, obviously we've, we've had thousands of students, right? And I've had students that are legit big wholesalers. And they're like, yeah, man, like, I don't know if I could flip houses. And I'm like, bro, you're literally, you're literally doing the hardest part about you've mastered finding deals and, and dispoing them. All you need to do now is get a hard money loan, raise some capital, do construction, but they literally feel like they can't do it. 
Like, and I'm not talking about like, oh, a guy that does 15 deals uh, a year. I'm talking about guys that do 20 deals a month and they just can't like, they just feel like they can't do it. So they never start flipping houses. But like you said, they're going to, they're going to transition to having to buy these properties. Well, um, what's interesting to me, uh, to me, that might be an exception. To me, what's, what I find fascinating is if I talk to off camera, off the education platform, if I talk to active wholesalers that have been in the business for a little while, they run a full operation. Most uh -huh. of them, most of them are doing a lot of non-assignment transactions, meaning they're double closing, they're taking them down and reselling mm -hmm. them on the MLS. They're doing some flips, maybe not, maybe not more flips and wholesales, but I'm just saying um, the assignment method is the lowest paying method in the entire ecosystem of flipping. It's the lowest paying method because you have to pass that on to the next guy and leave enough meat on the bone for them to do their thing and make money, right? Whereas yeah. if you take it down and then you resell it on the MLS, you skip the investor and go right to the retail buyer or you fix it up and go right to the retail buyer, like those value add techniques get make a lot more money if you do them right. So what we're finding here is most wholesalers, whether they'll tell you it or not, are, are transitioning or have been or have been for a while away from the assignment anyway. The, the reason why we talk about the assignment so much, why you hear about it on YouTube, why you hear about it on all these coaching programs is because it's the lowest barrier to entry. It's the lowest risk. It's the easiest way to get started. So because, because the education attracts the newbie, for the most part, it's the newbie. That's what we talk about because that's the easiest way to help somebody get started. It's not necessarily the best way or the, it's not the only way and it's not necessarily the best way. And I think what we've got to do in the education platform is we've got to just start getting more real with people that you're going to have to take some risk. You're going to have to oh, yeah. put your name on something. You're going to have to take title to something. You're going to have to raise some money. It doesn't mean it has to be your money, but you're going to have to take some level of risk to do this business well. Rather than just yeah. like, I want to have no risk, no money. I want free methods. I, I got in this argument, Brian. You, you'll find this funny. Uh, I teach how to wholesale on market, which is a free method because the agent it has the listing. You don't have to market, right, to find the lead. And this, uh, this, this person was on and they said, man, in, I'm in Texas. And in Texas, I've got a deal. I'm ready to sign the deal. I think it's a great deal that I can wholesale. And the mm -hmm. agent wants a $200 option fee. Here? Yeah. They, the agent wants a $200 non-refundable option fee to put the contract, to, yeah. to get the contract. And they're like, yeah. and they were pissed. Ryan! What up, what up? I was like, hey, what's dude? going on? People are you getting your, yelled at. Yeah, Jerry Norton, can you let me use your chair? Oh, Jerry I'm, Norton's I'm, yelling at me right now because he's I might, I might be raising my voice. <laughs> I get a little hyped up. <laughs> I, I can hear it all the way from the conference room. Yeah. <laughs> So pretty much we're talking about, I guess, just the, the shift in, in wholesaling. Is wholesaling going through a, a market bust? Oh, all right, we got disconnected, but we got a special guest, Ryan Pineda. So you jumped in mid-podcast, but Gary was going through just all the regulations that are happening. I don't know if you, if you heard about them, but uh, in Pennsylvania, um, they just passed a new law. We're pretty much almost banning um, wholesaling. Mm. Yeah. Can you give them the details? Yeah. It's not that they ban. it's not that they banned wholesaling. What they did is they require a license now to wholesale and you got to provide a bunch of disclosure. That's normal. Like that's what a lot of States are doing. What they did that was kind of unique was they said a seller or a buyer can cancel a contract for any reason without cause whatsoever for 30 days or until closing, whichever happens first. So basically your contract is useless and pointless. It, it has no, it serves no purpose whatsoever. This is all of real estate in Pennsylvania or no just, wholesaling. How would they know you're wholesaling versus a normal contract? Cause they define it as wholesaling. So they say, they say if your intent is to sell your equitable interest for a fee wholesaling. So what they do is they define wholesaling. They say, if you're going to wholesale, you have to have a license. You have to provide disclosure and the seller can cancel your contract for any reason up to 30 days. What if your intent's just to double close? Well, that's a gray area. So that's kind of the question on the street is, well, what if I'm double closing? 
And it's not super clear because there's some language that's vague. Like it says assign, sell, transfer. And then it also says uh, in the definition of wholesaling prior to taking legal title to the property. So if you think about it, double closing violates taking legal title to the property. It, it could or it couldn't because you're contracting your BC contract before you have legal title, but you're closing it after you've just bought it. So then you do have legal title. So it's a, that's a gray area. Double close is, is I think we can, and we're going to try it, but it, I don't, I don't know. We'll see how the, it all depends on how the real estate commission in Pennsylvania will define a double closing. Got it. Yeah. So there's but a without a doubt, an assignment, if it's an assignment, now here's the funny thing, Ryan, is like, okay, well, it says intent. Well, what if you say, oh, well, I changed my mind at the last minute. I didn't intend to wholesale it, but then I did. Well, the way they define intent is a couple things. Do you have the means to buy it? So do you have the capital or access to capital? Um, that's one way. The other way is what's your history of behavior? So if you're a wholesaler and you're actively wholesaling five deals a month and then you say, oh, well, my intent wasn't to wholesale. Well, yeah, it is. That's what you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're a serial wholesaler. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I'm not. Well, yeah, I mean, what's your behavior? So your behavior is that you wholesale, so you're a wholesaler. Yeah. Side note, I just I was watching a Netflix documentary, The, the Man with a Thousand Kids. Oh, yeah, that was a good one. It was funny. They're like, do you know he's, do you know he's, he's suing Netflix? He should. Yeah. But he, they're like, you're a serial donor. And I was yeah. like, what is this guy, a serial killer? Like, I didn't know that was a thing. So I'm going to call myself a serial wholesaler now. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, so we were just going through, like, all these laws. So in Pennsylvania, Virginia, Atlanta, South Carolina. Um, South Carolina is the scariest of all of them. Jerry, how do you keep up with all this crap? <laughs> it's a lot of work. You know, I, I monitor. <laughs> right now, there's there's a couple bills that are in process that I'm watching closely. You know, I, I don't freak out about it until it passes the House and the Senate, because once it pass, passes the House and the Senate, pretty much every time the governor signs it and it becomes law. Okay, so what I'm looking at on this document, how many actually passed? All of those except the bottom ones. Okay, got yeah, it. So yeah, well, so Pennsylvania is waiting for the governor to sign, and then it goes into effect six months later. So we have some, you know, so Ryan, hurry up and wholesale like crazy for six more months in Pennsylvania. We did do <laughs> one in Pennsylvania recently. Yeah. So I guess Jerry does like 25 wholesales a month. So uh -huh. this is... So, and then he's like in a bunch of different markets. So this is really like affecting his business. What are some scary ones coming up? Um, well, Oregon passed one. That's law now. If you, go, if you go up to the Oregon one, that one's really freaky. They require that you have to register as a wholesaler. You have to pass a background test. You can't have a criminal record. They do fingerprints. Like it's freaking like the Gestapo over there in Oregon. You got to do a lot. <laughs> One of my sales guys is toast. He's not going to be able to do it. Yeah. Most wholesalers are, I'm out. Oregon, I'm out. Yeah. Yep. That's funny. How many wholesalers have a criminal record like all of them, you know? Exactly. That's funny. But yeah, so Oregon, they got, they got all this disclosure. You got to have a license. So a lot of the states, like if you look at Iowa, Iowa said, got to have a license. You got to do disclosure. And if you don't, then there's a window of time where the seller can cancel the contract. That's why Pennsylvania was freaky because they said, it doesn't matter if you, if you follow the rules. It doesn't matter if you have a license. It doesn't matter if you disclose properly. We're giving the seller the right to cancel for any reason at all. Like what? what? How is that even a thing? How can you violate contract law? Yeah. And then which was the one, I forgot, the one that they defined what wholesaling is? and then just said that you cannot wholesale. Oh, that's South Carolina. So that's the scary one. So what South Carolina did is they said, okay, here's what wholesaling is. If you're going to wholesale, you have to have a license. Now, what that does is it brings it under the jurisdiction of the real estate commission because the real estate commission is an oversight for brokering, which is agents and property managers and now wholesalers. And then they say, now that you've got your license, you are not allowed to wholesale whatsoever, engage in it, help with it, participate in it at all. So they basically said, we do not want wholesaling to happen at all in South Carolina. We did like a 40K novation in South Carolina a couple months ago. Not anymore, because here's the problem now. Um, South Carolina is an attorney state, so real estate attorneys close the transactions. And 
good luck trying to find a, an attorney in South Carolina that will close a novation or an assignment. Now, maybe they'll do a double closing, but I don't even think they'll do those. And I've been trying to contact, like I've got, I haven't aired any of it, but I've got videos where I'll call like a, a closing attorney in South Carolina and I'll get them to try to talk about it on the air and they, they just won't. Like they're, they're freaked out because they're attorneys. They're not going to do something that might give them liability. Yeah. I think we have one. <laughs> <laughs> We've had wholesalers in here from South Carolina. Recently. Well, this is brand new. This is brand yeah. new. This is July. Like this is right now. This happened. Oh, this just passed in July. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So before yeah. I guess it was coming into law, and then now it is law. Yeah. This this has happened in the past month with South Carolina. Got it. Okay. So what's the workaround? Um, well, there's a couple workarounds. One might be to buy to set up an LLC and then sell the LLC. Okay, so that's not assigning or double. Maybe you can double close, but I don't think you'll be able to. Uh, selling an LLC is one method. And what I'm doing a lot of is, I call it the takedown method, but it's just wholetailing where you just buy the thing. Just buy it. Don't, don't recontract with a buyer. Buy it, take it down, trash it out, clean it, and put it back on the MLS and just resell it. You're not, you're not really fixing flipping. You're not, it's not wholesaling anymore. Uh, that's what I'm doing a lot of. That's, that's, I think, the future of wholesaling is to just buy it and resell it. Okay, so let's transition to the you mean You mean flip houses. <laughs> flip houses, yeah. <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> this... <laughs> it's called the takedown. It's called the takedown method. But it's just called you, flipping. What you do is you flip the house. <laughs> you just yeah. don't put a lot into it. You know, in the old days, we called this... <laughs> Buy real estate and sell real estate. That's what we used to yeah. call it. Buy real estate and yeah. sell real estate. Yeah. Okay. So let's transition to how you're doing almost 300 deals a year. So like, can you talk about like what markets, what marketing, um, and I guess like your sales process? Yeah. So in my core markets, I've got a partner that's on the ground and I've moved to a seller appointment model. Um, which is new for me because for years and years, I've just done it virtually, mostly for lifestyle. You know, you can live anywhere, do it from anywhere. It's great. Right. Um, but today I'm moving more to a, on appointment model. So I've got a partner on the ground in a specific market. We're trying to build a brand presence in that market. Um, and we go on appointment every, if it's somewhat warm of a lead, we go on appointment. Well, and the reason that, why the, the idea, what's that? It's just too competitive to try and do it yeah. virtually anymore. Yeah. 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 I mean, the seller you're talking to on the phone is, is got five contracts in front of them from other virtual wholesalers, right? So it's, 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 it's not that you can't. It's not that it doesn't work. What I'm finding, though, is if I'm spending all this money, thousands of dollars in marketing, I got to leverage that as best I can. And you will always close better face-to-face, belly-to-belly with a seller. You'll be able to overcome objections. You're looking at the house. You can build, you can build trust better you know, face to face always is better. So we're, we're now more of a face to face model. Um, and we try all kinds of marketing channels where we do, we do really well with PPC, which is Google ads. Um, uh, we're also doing quite a bit of PPL, which is pay per lead. So it's these services that just, you know, they vet the lead for you. Um, but we're also doing some direct mail. We do some cold calling. We do some, we do all the things, but, um, but I really like the high intent leads, the inbound leads, which is direct mail, the expensive stuff, direct mail, PPC and PPL. We tend to get, when I go back and I look at our deals, our, our best deals, right, are always PPC, PPL, direct mail. It's, it seems not always, but for the most part. What's your cost per lead right now in uh, some of these markets in those channels? Very, some markets are very expensive. So like we, we do uh, Polk which is Orlando between Orlando and Tampa is one of my markets. And, um, that's a highly competitive market. So your, your cost is dependent on demand in the market. So your, your hot markets like Vegas, Phoenix, I mean, it's very, very expensive cost per lead. Other markets, like I'm in Tulsa, we do Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it's very inexpensive in that market for like PPC because it's so all like, about demand. Let's, let's talk about Polk, because I know the county. So like, what are you guys spending on PPC and PPL and Polk? Yeah, so I mean, we'll pay for like a PPL lead, we'll pay $500 for one lead. Jerry, what if I told you, there's a company called Lead Kitchen that I just founded, where we're getting PPL quality leads in Orlando for a hundred bucks. I would, 
I would test that all day long, Ryan. Yeah. All right. How many all of those right, can I buy? I'm going to call you, Jerry. All right. I'm going to get my commission. Ryan's getting a commission. <laughs> no, we, we actually have, um, we have one guy. Dude, I cannot believe how cheap. I, I'm the opposite. I can't believe how cheap leads are in Central Florida right now near Orlando. Now, I know some are on the outskirts of Polk. But, like, dude, they're getting leads. We're getting leads on Facebook that are quality inbound. Lead. My whole business, I just started only doing Facebook marketing. Okay. And we're getting Central Florida for, like, 50 to 60 bucks a lead. Now, now, Facebook's different. I was talking just Google. so I would, But I would try those out. I would definitely try those out. Well, but PPL, most of these guys are using Facebook and TikTok and YouTube and everything else. That's why I asked PPL. I know PPC yeah. is going to be the most expensive, period. Yeah. But... Like PPL is getting that same lead that they're selling you for 500 bucks for 100 bucks, 150 bucks. And, yeah. you know, they're, they're charging triple. Are you do, do you do like an auction model where you have to? No, only okay. you get the lead. Yeah. It's okay. just a $3,000 retainer and you spend however much you want to spend. Yeah, I would, I would probably test that out in, in four or five markets. Okay. Let's freaking do it. All right. Everyone yeah. listening to this, just by the way, we're going to put an affiliate. There we uh, go. There's a, in the description <laughs> of this video. <laughs> no, and Brian the, backslash lead kitchen. No, when, <laughs> when you guys hop on the call, let them know Brian sent you. Yeah. And we'll yeah. get Brian his credit. There we go. Um, but no, like you're bringing up a point that I want to bring up to everyone on this call is that like cost per lead is the biggest problem right now in all business, in all of like business period. And wholesaling is obviously a business. And like, you're, you're talking about why you now have to go on appointments. Like you're, you're getting the same leads that you've probably always gotten for years. And now you're saying, well, dude, we're not converting the way we used to convert. We have mm -hmm. to do something different. We have mm -hmm. to go on appointments. I've been preaching appointments for four years. We've been doing it forever because I was well, used no, to no one wants to do it. It's not, it's not sexy. It's not, you know, you're on the beach with your laptop, right? Like that's why. Yeah. yeah but it's, it's what's necessary yeah. in today's game. And I'm a hundred percent advocate of a point. We tell all of our lead kitchen clients. I'm like, you guys better go on appointments. If you don't, you can, you can have some success, but you're not going to like it. It's crazy. We'll, we'll do like, uh, you know, you're on the phone and the seller's sort of telling you what's going on. And then, and then we're, and then we'll go on appointment and they'll tell you all kinds of stuff that they never would have told you on the phone. And you're walking out of there with a contract, right? Like that's how valuable appointments are. How, how much are you spending on marketing? And I guess like what kind of return on marketing are you, are you typically looking for? I mean, we try really hard to stay in that. Um, and again, this is market specific because some markets you spend a whole lot more, but your average contract price or, or profit is so much higher. Right. So, yeah. so it all, it all depends, but you know, some like a basic market, like a typical market, we try to spend anywhere from twenty five hundred to five thousand in marketing spend per contract. Okay. Now I'm pushing really hard for those contracts to be in the twenties, thirties, and even forty thousand per contract, right? Like I don't want to be doing. If you're transacting under fifteen thousand in a wholesale business, you're out of business. You're going to be out of business real soon mm -hmm. because your overhead, your commissions, your cost of marketing is going to eat up most of that, right? So. Yeah, so we're, we try to average 25000 on average per contract or higher is what we shoot for. Your goal is to 5X basically your ads. Yeah. yeah, and so with, P, like like with PPC, we push really hard for a 1 in 10 close ratio. Maybe 1 in 15 is pretty good too. But if I'm spending money on PPC and I'm not closing 1 in 10, 1 in 15, my cost, of con my cost per contract is going to go way up. Yeah, we right now are one in 16 contracts. It's awesome. Yeah, any, that's great. Yeah, that's yeah. great. That's really good. And, but I always tell, I always tell people, I'm like, look, when you're first starting out, you should have way higher ROI because, you know, it's just you working that lead to death. Yeah. At scale, I'm like, dude, if you can, like, at a minimum, at scale, and I'm talking spending 30, 40, 50 grand plus a month. If you can get a 3x, you'll make money. That's like the bare minimum to making money. If you can get a 4x, you got a pretty healthy business. Yeah. And then anything beyond that's gravy. Yeah. So if you think about that, if you're spending, you know, 20,000 and you're getting six to eight contracts, you know, and you're hitting 20K a contract, you're, you're doing pretty good. You're doing all right. Yeah. I mean, if you spend 20K to make 100K, you're doing really good. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. How much, what do you think is your total marketing spend a month and total revenue? Well, I mean, the challenge with wholesaling is very cyclical, right? So like we'll have, we'll have some months where we'll hit, you know, 150,000 the next month, 50,000. Cause it, yeah. it just all depends on when, when you close and so on and delays. And sometimes we'll throw in there a real banger that does like a hundred grand. And so that month we just killed it. But my goal and my goal in every single one of my markets is we're, we're a million dollar minimum million dollar a year in gross revenue. So about a hundred, one twenty a month is like minimum. And I, and I'm pushing my partners to, to get that to 3 million. And I think, I think the same team to do a million is the same team to do 3 million. You're just dialed in way better, right? No, no, not really any more overhead, not really any more sales team, not yeah. really any more spend, just, just dialed in better. So what do you think? Let's break that all down. But you think you're doing about like $6 million or $7 million a year in like revenue? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. And then what do you think like the, uh, a team should look like? that's doing a million to $3 million? Like how many acquisition people, how many dispo people, all that? You could do a million a year with one acquisition, one dispo, maybe a lead manager. Now you're gonna have some cold callers in there, maybe some VAs, uh, yeah. may maybe a little bit of admin, like bookkeeping, things like that. A, a TC, like some lower level support there. Um, and then the owner, right? The owner operator's also very involved. So they're they're helping with acquisitions. They're, maybe they're going on some appointment, but like, so I'll take, I'll take my one partner, Chris Allen in the panhandle. So we're on the Gulf coast with his market. And we did 158,000 in June was our gross revenue. And, and I keep telling him we should be at 300,000 month in and month out. Like we have this infrastructure, we have the leads, we have everything in place. Let's get this dialed in. So we're really working on dialing that in, but that's one acquisition, one dispo and a couple support staff on that team. And that's it to do. 150 a month. It's your partners doing acquisitions. Yeah. You guys have an yeah. No, no. So he'll, he'll go. So we have a full-time sales guy on acquisition, full-time sales guy on dispo, but he's very involved in both those. Yeah. He's very involved. And then to do a million to let's just say to do 1.5, how much marketing do you like, what are some major KPIs that you look for to see if it's like scalable or you're going to be spending 15 to 20 K a month to hit those numbers. That sounds very low. I mean, if you're average, it depends on your cost per contract, but if you're hitting, if you're spending 2,500, three grand, I mean, you're hitting four or five. Now, again, I'm looking for big wins too. So here's my, here's my philosophy on a, on a wholesale operation. I don't just want to be a wholesaler. I also want to be a flipper, but I want to be very selective about flipping. So mm -hmm. I try to look for a flip that's cosmetic. I'm in and out in a couple of weeks. It's a carpet and paint type deal. And it's a six figure net. If I can six figure net a cosmetic flip, I will take that down and flip that rather than wholesale it all day long. So I look, we're always trying to get one of those. So my goal would be hundred K in, in assignment type deals, hundred K in a flip or two, and then I like to do wholetailing, so takedowns, and those are typically 40 to 60 a deal, so, so one or two of those. So if I can do a couple wholesales, a couple wholetails, and one flip in there, I'm, I'm easily hitting 250, 300, and I'm only doing five, six, maybe, maybe seven deals to get there. A month. Does that make sense? Yeah. Maybe six to eight to what get there. What markets are you in? You said Tulsa, Orlando. Tulsa, uh, Orlando, the Gulf Coast of Florida. So I got two Florida markets. Um, Tacoma, Washington. Which ones am I missing? Scottsdale. Uh, I do a little. No, no, not active. Not a not an operation in Scottsdale. Um, what you do in Detroit or something like that? I do Detroit, but that's but again, I do flips. I do, so I do probably 15 to 20 fix and flips in Detroit every year. That's just my old stomping grounds. So, yeah. but not, I don't really have an operation set up there like actively doing deals. Yeah. Oh, and then Knoxville, Tennessee is my other one. Got it. So what is your, like your team look like? Cause I know you have partners and they have their teams. What is like your personal team look like? So my role in, in all my wholesale operations is I'm more of a leadership role. So, and then finance. So I do all bookkeeping we do, and I do all the funding. So earnest money, uh, you know, any money that goes into deals, I, I provide the finance and, and then 
and then just more of a, a uh, just coaching and helping the team. And so we meet weekly and I go through what they're doing and, and help them, you know, wherever they're, wherever they're, wherever the holes in the boat are, I try to help with them. But I'm not in the day to day. I'm not in the active. I'm not obviously on appointment. I live in Puerto Rico or Montana, you know. And so that's my that's my wholesale operations. Um, then I have fix and flips I do. So I've got fix and flips I do, and then I have my luxury flips I do. Um, and those are just a, I do a couple. We talked about that on the last podcast, Brian. But I do I try to do a couple like high high end luxury flips a year too. Yeah. But like, what about on your personal side? Like, do you have an assistant? Do you have, what do you have? So I have an operations manager that oversees the whole, like everything. They got their fingers in everything. And they're they're just keeping an eye on things. Uh, They get a little bit involved in some of the remote flips. Like they're they're managing the GC or whoever's in charge of the flip on the ground. They oversee those. So I've got right now probably four or five active flips that are somewhere in one stage or another. And that operations manager oversees them. They're also keeping an eye on my wholesale partners, right? They also help with my hotel. I own a hotel in Puerto Rico. Uh, They're helping with my $6 million new build I'm doing right now. Um, They helped. We just, I just flipped a house in Puerto Rico for like an $800,000 house. So they're sort of involved in everything from the operational standpoint. Mm. Right. So, and then, uh, personal assist, I got a couple of admin that are more on the executive secretary, personal assistant side of things. Mm -hmm. And that's it for, for deals. You know, then I have my education company and software company and that's a whole nother thing, but, but that's it on the deal side. What's your software company? So I have Flipster, which is a CRM for wholesalers and flippers, which is a Mm. cool little software built that launched that in 2014. So I've had that around for a while. Um, and then I have PropWire, which is a fairly new software for uh, data for seller data. Mm. And that's, that's my latest project. That's, we launched that about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And we have uh, 170, 180,000 users on that software Mm -hmm. right now. So that's, that's really fun. Got it. Yeah. No, I think um, he's saying all the same things that um, I think everybody's seeing out there right now that, you know, marketing's getting more expensive. Mm -hmm. You have to be super dialed in in your sales process Mm -hmm. to even make the margin you used to make Mm -hmm. because we don't really have market momentum anymore. So it's not like you're selling flips for 50 grand more than you thought you were going to sell them for. Um, So it's like, if if you're not good at follow-up and you're not good at keeping your cost per contract where it needs to be, then you'll be in business. (laughs) And I would add to that, I would add to that, Ryan, you cannot be a one trick pony. I think, I think an operation that relies solely on just fix and flip or just assignments or just any one thing is going to struggle. You've got to be able to look at, you got to be able to look at every situation and find the highest and best use of that particular deal because that's how you maximize your, your lead flow and your profit. I agree. I, I think like in my career, my first, let's say like 400 deals, 95% of them were flips, nothing mm-hmm. more than just a flip. Mm-hmm. I barely wholesaled. And then when I went through my first tough time, I was like, oh, wholesaling's pretty good. You get, some, <laughs> you get some cash flow each month. I don't have to wait for the flip to sell and always have money going out and yeah. investing into the next deal and all this stuff. And then, um, you know, you look at, we had to start doing novations and Mm -hmm. other things. And, you know, now like with the marketing and lead kitchen, that was just another way to create a stream of income with what I had already created. And yeah, you know, it's just like, all right. Yeah. Like you can't be a one trick pony in this game. You got to have multiple cash conversion cycles for real estate. I think you're doing the right thing though, Ryan. I mean, honestly, any business that can be good at lead gen Right. If, if you if you can get to the deals at the acquisition level, you've got you've got every opportunity now in the world. Right. You're not relying on an agent. You're not relying on a wholesaler to feed your business. You know how to go get deals direct. And if you can get deals direct, you will. You, I think you'll never starve like you'll always make it because now you got options. Right. You could you could wholesale it. You could take it down and flip it. You could do multiple things because you're you're getting it at the deep right? You're, you're buying deep and, and you're creating all the meat on the bone. You're creating the opportunity. 
I think every real estate company should be an acquisition company first and foremost, is my opinion. Yeah. Well, that's why I've always been of the mindset of that. If you can learn to flip houses, you can do anything, right? You got to learn to find great deals. You got to learn how to raise capital. You got to learn how to handle construction. If you can do those three things, you can wholesale, you could buy and hold, you can do everything. Yeah. So I'm, I'm with you on that. And um, yeah, I just think that the future is, I mean, honestly, this industry's future, and it, it, it was always this way anyways, but it was always a sales and marketing business at the end of the day. And I think people are realizing now that sales has got to be way more dialed in with their follow-ups and automations and everything else. And then on the marketing side of it, everybody's just sitting around looking for answers because every way you turn marketing is getting harder. Up TCPA is not letting me text and cold call the way I used to. Mm -hmm. Up PPC cost has doubled since last year. Up, you know, these PPL companies, I don't know if they're selling my leads to other people and, you know, that used to be good, but now they're, they got this mm -hmm. thing going on or they can't even give me enough leads based on what I want to spend. And so even like direct mail, like, even like direct mail, yeah. it's like, oh, you know, mail it three times. No, mail it six times. Okay, now I'm mailing it six times, you know? Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did TV commercials for four years. I spent millions of dollars and it was great until it wasn't. And yeah. then, you know, it's like, um, that's why I'm, you know, I'm excited about what we're doing because uh, I've already, for, for our customers, I already tested on myself. So we run literally <laughs> my ads in other people's markets. So we already know they work. I don't need Jerry Norton to film an ad. Well, Jerry, you'd be okay filming an ad because you do content. But 99% of other people <laughs> suck at filming yeah. an ad. They don't have copywriting skills. They don't have direct response, you know, skills or any of these things that generate leads on social media. And that's why they all fail at social media. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I would add to that too. Like if you look at, you know, what Brian and I originally were talking about was like where wholesaling's heading. And I think, I think um, everybody in this business is going to also have to learn how to raise capital. Like you got to yeah, be able to fund, fund deals. And if, if you're intimidated by that or you don't learn that skill, you will always be limited. And now with regulation more and more so because it's just going to get harder and harder to do the, the true like no money techniques are going to be a relic. They're going to be a thing of the past at some, at some point in the future. You're going to have to buy the freaking thing and then sell it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Transactional funding time. There you go. What about yeah. like, um, are you buying rentals yet or you're still not buying any rentals? I mean, if you, if you make me buy one, I will, you know, <laughs> but I don't like them. I don't like them. Yeah. It's just not, I just, I just, I'd like to find other ways to not pay taxes. If that's the only way I'll do it. But I, I, I definitely see when the thing is, is when you know how to transact, Doing rentals for income is the stupidest idea ever because there's so much better ways to make money than a rental. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I'm okay with it for a tax strategy, but again, if I can find other tax strategies that don't involve owning rentals, I'm, that's me. I'm there. So you moved to Puerto Rico. And stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's the Band-Aid solution. <laughs> <laughs> Have you met Jake Paul out there? Uh, he's pretty loud. Everybody, I know where he lives and he's pretty loud. Like he, he's got, he's got no problem. Like, you know, offending everybody where he's at, you know? Okay. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and then I guess like we, we were going to talk about it, but what are you, what are your thoughts on what's going to happen with like novations? I think novations also have a, sh a shelf life because they fall into that bucket of uh, making money before you own the property. And mm -hmm. that's really where the end game is. So, so the end game of wholesaling, these regulators, what they want to stop they're doing it sort of wrong because they, they just don't know what they're doing and they don't understand wholesaling well enough. So they write these laws and the way they write these laws, it's very poorly written. So then we're all like excited because, oh, there's a loophole here, right? Like they didn't say novations, yeah. but what they're trying to stop, and this is what I was telling you earlier, Brian, what they're trying to stop is transacting where you don't yet own the property. So that would be an assignment. That would be a double close because a double close, you contract before you own the property. So if you're not allowed to transact before you own it, you're not allowed to contract something you don't yet own. That's a double closing. Mm -hmm. And that would be novations because you don't actually own the property that you're selling on a novation. So any of those strategies where you don't actually own the property before you remarket it or resell it is where they're after. That's what they're after. Mm. Got it. So will it take time? You know, how, how soon and who and when, and I, you know, that'll time will tell. 
I will say this, this regulation on wholesaling is aggressive. Just this year, there's been, I think, six or seven of the states on that list that I gave you, that, mm-hmm. that wholesale regulation, all are this year. Like, you know, it's, so it's snowballing. You're starting to see a, a, a domino effect happen with this. Got it. And then do you share this list with people? Or? Yeah, if you, it's a download. If you go to uh, wholesaleregulations.com, you can download that list. I try to update it. Every time something comes out, I update it. So, um, and you can see on there, like Connecticut's got a bill right now that's in play. Uh, Maryland had a really aggressive one that died, but they're, but they're saying that they're going to reintroduce it. Uh, Texas is exploring regulation right now with wholesaling. I mean, everybody is. So what was interesting is, is, uh, this South Carolina commissioner that I, I did a YouTube video with, um, Gary Pickering, he said that the commissioners across all the states, they mastermind like we investors do. And they go to these conventions and they get together and they talk about, well, oh, what are you doing in your state and what's going on? What are you seeing? And he said at these conventions, the number one topic that they all talk about every time is wholesaling. Mm-hmm. And the, the conversation is, what do we do about these freaking wholesalers? How do we stop them? Is the conversation. Right. And this is not me saying this, this is him saying that. So they're very concerned about it. You know, they're hearing the seller, the old, the old grandma getting kicked out of her house by a wholesaler and all the, all the horror stories. Uh, which, by the way, most of that's just not true at all. You know, it's the one percent that ruin it for everybody else thing. I was, just, I just had this vision of them like sitting around masterminding, like this Jerry Norton and yeah. this Ryan Pineda <laughs> yeah. teaching people how to wholesale. Yeah. And, you know, kicking grannies out. <laughs> yeah, kicking old ladies out to the curb. You know, like that's what they talk uh, about. Like in Pennsylvania, uh, the the two senators that introduced that bill and pushed that bill through. On their website, they talked about this, this, you know, SB 1173 bill. And they said on there, they said, uh, wholesalers, they prey on the vulnerable. They trick sellers into selling their house far below market value. Like this is the language they're using about why they're putting this regulation in place. All of it's derogatory, all of it's negative, all of it's predatory. Wholesalers are these bad people out there screwing over sellers. When the reality is, is, no one else is going to serve those sellers but wholesalers. Like agents can't help them. Nobody can help them, right? Because they're in distress. They got to close quick. They, they're, you know, it's a problem. They, they don't want anybody coming in their home. Like there's only one person that's going to help them, and that's wholesalers. I got a, I got a funny statistic. I was actually doing an analysis on all of our in-seller appointments, and um, we had okay. So we had this pool of appointments. We had one fifteen percent of them. So. You know, basically one out of seven. You know, not where I want to be. I want to be one out of five. So, you know, it was, we got some work to do. But they, they had won about 15%. And then we looked up to see how many have sold. There was another 15% that had sold via either other flippers, realtors, wholesalers, whatever, right? Somebody bought it. It wasn't us. Um, the other 70% still own their house right now. <laughs> and so it just kind of shows you that yeah, like in the end, these people like they can't sell their house because they're unrealistic or they, they just have some kind of mental, like whatever the mm-hmm. issue is. They just mm-hmm. they don't want to sell. They can't sell. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's really sad to see this like derogatory approach to it. But, you know, if you look at it, it's all led by NAR. So the National Association of Realtors, they're behind all of this. They push it really hard. In Pennsylvania, they set up a wholesaler task force, and then they had two <laughs> got way bigger problems. Than, than, I know, than wholesalers. but they they feel like wholesalers are taking their business right. So, and then when the when that bill was uh, was to vote in the House, the National Association of Realtors got two hundred and fifty agents to go to the Capitol building to support passing this bill against wholesalers. Mm-hmm in Pennsylvania. Like they're very, very involved in stopping wholesalers. It's all National Association of Realtors behind it. Wow. They do not want wholesalers. Don't they have the- like a $2 billion thing they got to go fight right now? <laughs> like, what are they doing? <laughs> I don't know. But this is right now. Like this, this happened- Over their own manipulation of commissions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, what's funny to me, Ryan, and I joke about this, I'm licensed so I can, I can poke fun of this. Um, I think I've run into more shady agents than I ever have wholesalers. Yeah. So, I mean, I licensing and ed- education and training and oversight doesn't stop 
somebody from doing some harm to somebody, you know, like that's still going to happen. Yeah. yeah. That's a okay, character thing, not a licensing thing. Yeah. Um, last question I have about marketing new flippers and wholesalers. Do you think they should be doing texting and cold calling? I mean, that's a dying strategy. Um, there's so much now around that with compliance. And I mean, like you're, you got the ambulance chasers now that are after that. I mean, if you look at, let me put it this way. If we look at from just 2022 to 2023, and this is everybody I talk to, this is all the biggest wholesalers I know, the income from texting and cold calling has gone way down. So it's, it's just, it's just a challenging model. I, I don't think you get rid of it completely, but I'm certainly not putting all my eggs in the cold call text basket. It had a window of time. Like when it was awesome, it was awesome. It was the most amazing thing because it was so low cost, but it's very challenging now. Yeah. My, my opinion is it's, it still works, obviously. But yeah. Yeah. To your point, it's hard and it's not scalable. It's just, it's not. Yeah. But you still do it. Yeah, we still do it. I mean, we throw some budget at it and we have some VAs that we have for cold callers and, bec but it's, it's a long close cycle. So your cash conversion cycles are long. It's a ton of follow up. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, it's tough. It's cheap. So we do it, but it's, it's just a tough model. <clears throat> Got it. it it's great. Right, if well, you've got a low budget or no budget, it's a great strategy. I would say that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we'll put the, the links of your stuff in the description of this video. Um, and if people are listening to this on audio and Spotify, where do they go if they want to um, reach out to you or, or see your stuff? Yeah, I mean, I'm most active on YouTube. So if you go to Flipping Mastery, you can check out my YouTube channel. And I talk about all these regulations on my channel. I get a lot of hate for it, but uh, but it's the reality of what's happening. And I'm trying to help people see what happens and how to pivot. Yeah, but that's probably yeah. the best place. Beautiful. And if you guys want to learn more about Lead Kitchen and how to get leads for free, uh, we'll put something in the description of this video. All right. All right. Thank you, Jerry Norton. Appreciate you coming on, brother. Good seeing you, bro. Yeah. Good seeing you, Ryan. Thanks, Brian. Yep. All right. See ya.